this beautiful March's evening and a couple of announcements. I would appreciate your prayers. Please be with uh, Nancy Lang, who's having gallbladder surgery tomorrow morning. And also would appreciate your prayers to be with the family of Lou Alexander. And Lou died just this afternoon. We don't know for sure when the service will take place. Uh, there, it looks like it might be Saturday visitation and Sunday service, Sunday afternoon service here at the church. And she will uh, be at Rubenberg's. Will you please, uh, let's start off with the, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. When our lives are joyous and laughter abounds, when the news is grim and we have nowhere to turn, in the water and word, bread and wine, in our life, in our death, in the new life to come. First lesson is from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, 
that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices, and my body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second lesson is from the second chapter of Galatians. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law I have died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among themselves and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did, and sitting down they kept watch over him there, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Here is your son, and to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Sama Lama Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received a drink, Jesus said, It is finished. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his life. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joses, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be the special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it was given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may have faith. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. None of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea and was waiting for the kingdom of God. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus was already dead. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph took the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, Joseph's own new tomb that he had cut out of a rock in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there 
and rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was alive, that imposter said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Concluding uh, sermons on the Lord's Prayer this evening, I'd like to say a few words about lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I say this once in a while because I truly believe it. Um, I do not believe in evil people. I do not believe in good people, with all due respect. I believe there are people who sometimes do incredibly evil things. I believe there are people who sometimes do incredibly good things. And sometimes it's the same person who does both. And we all commit those evil acts. We all commit the good ones as well. In El Salvador, many years ago, there was a group of Catholic nuns who were raped and murdered. And as the horrible event was happening, what they did was they prayed together the Lord's Prayer over and over and over. In Salem, just before some of the people who were executed as witches died, they prayed the Lord's Prayer over and over and over. In the Moravian missionary village of Nathan, in Tuscarawas County in Ohio. In the year 1782, the Pennsylvania militia came over into that area. It's right on the border of Pennsylvania. They found this Moravian village. These people did not even have any weapons in the village. But they believed that they were the ones who attacked their settlement nearby. So these Indians were all executed, all 96 of them, even though they had nothing whatsoever to do with the crime. And as they were awaiting their execution in the early morning hours, they sang hymns and repeated the Lord's Prayer over and over. Included in that prayer was deliver us from evil. It didn't stop the evil thing from happening. It still happened. But it stopped the evil thing from defeating them. They had the final victory. And I believe it did, in fact, deliver them from evil. Because the evil did not overcome them. Just as evil does not have to overcome us. We are tempted to make things easier than what they actually are. I think we very often do that with our faith. Albert Einstein warned that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not too simple. And you make it too simple, and all of a sudden, it doesn't mean much of anything. And you take away the whole meaning of it. We need God to protect us from the evil of the world even though some of that evil will still occur. Some of it will happen to us. We do not have to give in to the evil. We can be delivered from it. And sometimes we are delivered from evil that is waiting within us. We're no different than that small child who will lay in bed in the dark at night and watch his or her toys turn into monsters and wonder what is lurking underneath the bed and in the closets. We are very much like that. Sometimes we do evil acts without even thinking that they're evil. Out of fear, out of insecurities, we imagine things, we blow them out of proportion, we create situations, trouble where none existed before. So Augustine reminds us Never believe that evil is something that is totally outside of yourself. We ask in this petition to be delivered from the evil 
evil that is not only out there in the world, but the evil that is within us, the evil that comes through us. Uh, several years ago, they had what they called blood diamonds. There actually are still some blood diamonds in existence in this world. But back in the 1990s, it was at its height of blood diamonds. These diamonds were mostly from the country of Sierra Leone. The fact is, is that they made people get these diamonds out of the ground. They used people as slaves. They virtually stayed there all the time in the diamond mines. Middlemen then bought the diamonds from the people who extracted them from the ground. And big diamond companies bought them from the middlemen. And the big diamond companies knew very darn well what they were doing. They were buying these diamonds that were covered in blood from the people who mined them. The people would buy them, not really caring where they came from. It was just a beautiful diamond. Thousands and thousands and thousands of diamonds sold that way, including in this country. Well, they kind of cleared up that mess. Today they figure there's somewhere around 3 or 4% of the diamonds that are mined are blood diamonds. But now we have something called coltan. Coltan is a metallic ore. 80% of it is in the country of Congo. Congo has been um, in the process of killing the people in that country. They have been killing each other through rebel groups and through groups that have come in from Rwanda for the past 13 years. We figure over 5 million people have been killed in that conflict. Just think of that. 5 million. Sometimes they make people mine coltan. You know what coltan is used for? It's metallic ore after it's processed. Anyone have a cell phone? You have a laptop? You have a pager? Many other electronics. That's what it's used for. And some of that coltan that is in our products, the products that I myself use, I guarantee you, is from Congo. And it indeed has blood on it. But we use those things not really thinking about it. And onward it goes. They have what they call digital dumping grounds in the country of Ghana. Digital dumping ground is where a lot of computers and cell phones, all the old equipment is wound up in a, in a uh, kind of a garbage dump there. Kids will go into the digital dumping grounds and they will wind up melting away the plastic to get scraps of paper and scraps of iron to be able to sell, to have a few dollars to be able to live. Everybody knows that. And a lot of those things are sent over there under the guise of, they say that they are donations to the country. Of course, not to mention the garden industry. And it goes on and on. There's always enough evil to go around, always enough sin. And none of our hands are clean. We all need delivered not only from sin and the evil around us, but also that which is within. And we should not always be looking the other way. Luther tells us God tempts no one to sin. That is absolutely true. God does not. But everyone and everything else in this world does. It will at one time or another. And at times we're going to be those stumbling blocks for other people. Evil is going to happen. Evil is real. Some more is going to happen to us today, tomorrow. Sometimes we will have evil thoughts in our heads. Maybe we even have a couple right now. People will try to hurt us. They'll try to cheat us. They'll try to lie to us. They'll try to betray us and neglect us. Some people will even try to kill other people. All sorts of evil out there. But God can deliver us from that evil. 
does not have to define us. The love of Christ can define us. There's a little boy who was sitting on a fence that separated his parents' house from his neighbors. And he was eyeing a strawberry patch there, and I love this story. The neighbor asked, are you trying to steal my strawberries? The little boy said, no, I'm trying not to. Sometimes we are tempted to do the right thing. And sometimes we give in to that temptation and we do the right thing. And sometimes the opposite. Did you know that Karl Marx's parents were Jewish? Karl Marx, the guy that wrote uh, yeah, Das Kapital, that guy, communist guy, his parents were Jewish. His father's name was Heinrich. Heinrich uh, wanted to practice law in Prussia. But the trouble was, in Prussia at that time, Lutheranism was the state religion. So Heinrich had to convert to Lutheranism in order to become a lawyer. <coughs> Karl Marx saw that, and it's part of what irritated him about religion. And it's part of what people, historians feel, kind of twisted up his mind. Temptations come in all sorts of strange ways and strange places and strange forms, good ones, bad ones, very harmful ways, sometimes very innocent ways, sometimes very intentional, sometimes not. There's a book called Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus is also known as the Wisdom of Sirach. And the Wisdom of Sirach is what is in, all, called an apocryphal book, and the Catholic Church is accepted as part of the Bible. We do not do that formally in the Lutheran Church. But Ecclesiasticus has some pretty cool stuff in it. Ecclesiasticus chapter 17 verse 1 says, The Lord God created man from the earth and then sent him back to it. Created in his image and then sent right back to it. God lifts us up, he brushes us off, he cleans us off, puts us back into the scheme of things. Back where all the temptations of the world await us. Back amidst all the hypocrisies and inconsistencies. All the evil, all the good. My mother-in-law, uh, God rest her soul, was a very, very naive woman in a lot of ways. And one of the ways in which she was naive was that she didn't understand uh, all the obscenities. Not that that was a fault. I mean, I just mean she did not. And she would sometimes receive, and this one time in particular, her family always likes to tell the story, she got this obscene phone call. And she had no idea it was an obscene phone call. And this man kept on breathing hard and saying these different things, and she kept on telling him she didn't understand and didn't understand, and what was he talking about? And she finally hung up the phone, and she told her kids what he had said, and of course they all burst out laughing. They knew what it meant, but she didn't. Wouldn't it be nice if we had no idea what this stuff of the world means, what the evil means? Instead, we only know what Christ is trying to tell us. And it would be nice if we had a world like that. I understand what it means. I have times taking part in it. Not proud of myself. But I've done it. The truth is we understand all too well the evil of the world that is around us that sometimes grabs hold of us sometimes choke us. But Jesus will never abandon us to any destructive force around us or in us. He will never do that. Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, will deliver us from evil.
Lord of all life, when we cannot see the beauty of your creation. When we neglect the poor, the sick, the grieving. When we ignore the cries of injustice in our midst. When we are hardened against our neighbor. When we are closed to the grace you long to give us. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.